Tonight we're pleased to present an in-depth conversation with a woman who has been a voice of America's conscience since the 1960s. Marion Wright Edelman was the first black woman to pass the Mississippi Bar. She's a prominent figure in the civil rights movement, but it is her continuing struggle for the nation's children that sets her apart. The founder of the Children's Defense Fund, she has written a powerful guide to family life in the measure of our success. I am pleased to have an old friend join me here in New York and to uh, welcome her to this oak table. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Nice to see you. Thank now, you why did you write this at this time? Because um, it is it is a letter to to all children, mm -hmm. and in, and you say a letter to my children and yours. What what was the imperative here? Well, there were two things that provoked me to do that. One is my oldest son. I have three wonderful sons, but when my oldest son, Joshua, was about to be 21, I tried to think hard about what is it I could give him that was really important and that would have lasting effect. And what came to me was that I could give him a spiritual and family diary. He could, you know, just as an insurance policy, because I wasn't quite as sure that my children knew what got me through the day and keeps yeah. me doing what I do as I knew what my parents did. I never sort of get into a tough situation that I don't think about what would mama say about this or what yeah. would daddy say about this. And we were very clear about what our parents valued. And I have tried to be clear about that with my kids. But just in case, I wanted yeah. to do a written yeah. reminder All that right. here are the things that are really important, kiddo, and here's some values yeah. that don't change. And so it just grew from there. Now, these, you got three, three children. You've three got children. Joshua, Jonah, and Ezra. Right. right. Is Ezra the... Is it Ezra? Ezra's our, my youngest, who's yeah. a senior in high school. She's at Sidwell Friends or something? He, all boys, all boys. He, all Ezra boys. is at Sidwell Friends. Ezra's at Sidwell Friends, about to graduate this year. Jonah is is a senior at Yale and about to go to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Right. And Joshua teaches... At Middleton Academy. At, he graduated from Harvard last June, and Ezra's about to go up to Yale this fall. Yeah. And what do you want to say to them about spirituality? Your father, a Baptist minister, uh, you grew up with, and I know that part of the music you love now is spirituals. Right. Uh, what do you want to say about a spiritual connection and how does one find meaning uh, amidst all that we are bombarded with in terms of materialistic values? Well, my basic message to them first is that I just love them more than I can ever say. <laughs> and that there's nothing they can ever do or say they can ever take away that love. And secondly, that they can, as they leave home, that I go with them. Yeah. I go with them in my prayers and that they are never alone. Thirdly, that, you know, despite the messages of this culture which say that life is about things and about right. acquiring, about fame, about prestige, that that's not really what life is about. And that what's real important is caring for other people. It is trying to leave the earth better than you found it. It's about things inside that matter. And that despite what television and all the others may say about violence, that that's not the way to resolve problems, that that's the opposite of love. That despite what they say about success, that what success really has to be, which is what my father and mother taught me, is about service that serving is the rent that everybody pays for living and that that's what serving is, is the, the rent, rent that every human being pays for living and that those with extra intellectual and material gifts have a, an obligation and a responsibility and a privilege of reaching back and helping others and so that, that is life is what's important is inside your head and inside your heart not outside yeah, I, all I these I know things. you give them that but I got to tell you that it, it must be difficult and Jonah reflects on this a son who's the Rhodes Scholar when he says the publication of my mother's book is a project I have both feared and welcomed. Feared because everyone will realize the legacy, the legacy to which I am tied and the standards I feel responsible to uphold, standards by which few except my mother could live. But I welcome it for the same reason it will spur me on. Then he goes on, when I am feeling paralyzed by a task that seems too difficult, I remember the love that lies at the core of my family and their legacy to me. The love gives strength and I can move on again. Here is why I mention that. It is that there are too many young children, young teenagers in our world today who don't have that love for all kinds of reasons and all that that love brings. And you wonder how that is shaping them. Well, it is shaping them, I think, in a not good way. And one of the messages you want to send is that parents are the most important people in children's lives and we parents have got to communicate and be there for our kids. It's even more important in this, this era of AIDS, of violence, of, of, of teenage parenthood yeah. too early, of, of all of these messages that they get from outside the culture so that it is so important for parents to say despite all of these changes there are some things, honesty, yeah. you know, morality, right. helping yeah. other people that don't change regardless of the, you know, the cultural changes, regardless of what our yeah. political leaders may say. But here comes Marion Wright Edelman, a known liberal, 
no, I'm liberal, and some things I'm deeply conservative. You know, I hate these labels, <laughs> I know Charlie. You do. Okay. But but here you come, and conservatives are saying, "All right, that's what we've been saying for a long time." Family values, family values, family values. And I know politics is not the game that we're talking about, but in a sense, in America, uh, family values seem to have been identified more with conservative rhetoric, rhetoric than liberal rhetoric. See, I don't buy that. That's the other reason I wrote this book, because okay. I want them to know that I come from a tradition of strong families, of family values, of family rituals, and of people who live what they preach, not talk, not judge. My faith tells me not to say, you know, that poor families are single parents or are less good than anybody else. My faith tells me to help them, not to judge them. God judges, okay? Right. And so one of the reasons I want I come out of a deep tradition of self-help. Black folk have been helping themselves all of their lives. Because that's and, all they that's had all to they depend had on because they couldn't look to anybody else and so don't preach to me about what I should do for myself. That's why I started the Children's Defense Fund. That's why I went to Mississippi. That's why I try to do the service and I believe very deeply in service and in family values. I am deeply conservative in many ways. I'm moderate on some things. I'm liberal on some things. I'm radical. We need to stop this labeling because children don't fit into any one ideology yeah. and all of us have got to be for families. But secondly, I understand, and this is where I differ with the right, that is not enough to preach and it's not enough to sort of be against the hot sins. You also got to yeah. help Hot sins parents. or behavioral sins? Behavioral sins, you know. I mean, we've also got to help people who want you want to have yeah. values. They got to have something to eat. It's, yeah. it's hard to have strong values if you can't, don't have a shelter over your head, you know, and you don't have any supports in your community. You're saying that every, the fundamental needs in terms of, of whether you had enough nutrition and whether you had enough shelter and whether you had enough love is every bit as important as to these sort of hot sins like how many, um, what your sexual conduct was yesterday afternoon? You know, I'm for moral conduct, okay, but I also understand that hungry people and homeless people and ignorant people and people who are uneducated people are people who can't make ends meet, have a hard time sort of understanding about yeah. being preached to and what they ought to do. The fact is this country is hypocritical. We talk family, valleys, and yet we don't support families. We oppose parental leave policies, okay? We oppose children's allowances with most other industrialized nations do we don't even give our families basic health insurance so that their children can get care when they get sick those are our family values we don't even provide for jobs and economic security our young families of all races and it's not just poor or black children who are in trouble in this country it's all of our kids but young families of all races trying to get off the ground today having a heck of a hard time because of the decline in wages the lack of jobs the lack of their ability to buy a house why and so it, we really need to start putting up rather than talking. in America America, in terms of infant mortality, in terms of a whole series of indicia of how a nation state takes care of its children, how a nation takes care of its children, we don't score as well as we do in terms of per capita income, as well as we do in terms of percentage of natural resource, all those kinds of things. Why? Is it, a is it a function of leadership? Is it a function of caring? Is it a function of, of spiritual connection? What? I think it's a little bit of all of those things, and that is the question we need to be asking each of ourselves and of our political leaders this year. Why is it that the wealthiest nation on the earth can't do better than 23 other nations in keeping our infants alive? Why is it when UNICEF is making great progress and getting children immunized in third world countries, our non-white infants lag in their immunization rates behind 69 other nations, even when we know that every dollar we invest saves $10 on the other end? Why is it we're the only industrialized nation that doesn't... You mean doesn't if we spend more money today in terms of a child who was born uh, 10 minutes ago, we'll save a lot of money we'll have to spend at the other end of their life? Well, we don't invest in prevention in this country. We know how to prevent diseases. We know how to immunize nice kids. We know if we put a dollar in immunization, we'll save $10 on the other end. We know that Head Start works. Right. Every dollar we put in saves almost $6 on the other end. Why don't we do it? Why do we let children die Why? in this rich nation from poverty? One is, I think that we don't care enough. We are hypocrites. We don't back up what we preach with our deeds. Our political leaders are not providing the moral leadership to place children first. We just sat, I sat in the United Nations here a couple, last year and saw the leaders of the world come and debate the adoption of a convention on the rights of the child because there's a growing ethic throughout the world that preventable child suffering is immoral and unacceptable just as there was an ethic in an earlier age against slavery and against apartheid and our nation the United States of America is one of a few nations more than 140 nations signed that that have not signed that convention 
Here's what I don't understand, and I really, it, it is sheer, I don't understand. I don't know the answer. It would seem to me, if I am a Machiavellian, self-serving politician whose primary goal is to be elected, let's assume that's my mindset, that there's no better issue than children. It connects us. It's fundamental. It goes to some, something that ought to be at the essence of our being, how we care about our children. I agree. Yet, but why? I mean, it does, I don't get children the politics of it. Children don't vote. They don't make campaign oh, contributions, yeah, okay? They don't lobby. Yeah. And we have this very wrong notion that somehow it's just other people's children who are suffering right. rather than sort of looking at the fact that drug and alcohol abuse, child abuse and neglect is hitting, cutting across race and class. But you know, that's beginning to change because our middle class kids are really beginning to have a very hard time. Middle class parents in New Hampshire who thought they could never lose their home, mm -hmm. would never be in a food stamp line, are beginning to understand that. We are now having to do a massive public education job because a lot of Americans want to deny and think that poverty and lack of work and lack of health insurance is something that happens in the third world. Well, you know, we have more poor children in America than there are in the nation of Zimbabwe. We have more Americans without health insurance than there are Canadian citizens. And what we also have to come to grips with is that, you know, there are more white poor kids, there are more poor kids in working families than there are black kids. You know, that there are more white kids who are having babies as teens than there are black kids, even though it is a major problem in our black community. And we understand, we have to understand that it is working parents who are struggling today to make ends meet, and these are not other people's problems. They affect all of us. Let me just speak to the question of single parent, of, right. of single kids, of teenagers, unmarried, right. having children. Right. What should we do about it, whether it is a black or a white or, a, or whatever? We've got to do a number of things. There are no magic bullets. But one is we've got to do everything we can to prevent it. And it requires two sets of strategies. One is giving our young people the capacity to prevent pregnancy. Parents need to talk to their kids about their sexuality. It's a normal part of life, but we need to give them a value context. And we need to talk to and them about the And it's best done by parents? I would prefer parents should communicate with their kids. And the parents can do it, but teachers should do it, and religious leaders should do it. But we need to set a climate where young people can understand how they should deal with their sexuality and we need to talk to our boys as well as our girls. I am tired of this assumption in this society that it is girls who should be chased and boys should score. Right. We need to understand it takes two to tango and produce a baby. And right. so we talk to your boys as well as your girls. Tell them to wait. You know, tell them they got enough to handle growing up. But secondly, you have to sort of make sure that they understand how to prevent pregnancy. If they are not able to wait, yeah. you know, and many are sexually active, we should get our heads out of the sand and teach them about contraception. But thirdly, the most important thing we must do is to recognize recognize it is just not about capacity. We have got to give young people the motivation to prevent pregnancy, and that's about hope. The two largest predictors of who's going to become a teen parent, you know, are basic skills level. If kids are doing well in school, right. feel competent, feel good about they, themselves. They don't want to have, they, they want to defer having they children they because they don't want to want mess up. in their future. They, want, they don't right. want to mess up. And then secondly, children who, um, poverty is the second big predictor. Young people who feel there's a future, who have positive life options, who have things to do with themselves, who have recreation and sports. I'm so glad my kids had access to the wrestling and soccer and football and basketball. I was so tired by the time they got home. They didn't have any energy to get into trouble. Well, poor kids need the same kind of ways. They need young, oh, they they need role models. They need adults who are communicating with them, who are giving them ways of feeling useful. They need things to do. Whenever you hear a young person who's gotten into trouble, whether it's about pregnancy or drugs, or you ask them, why did you do that? They said, didn't have nothing better to do. I think that's a terrible indictment of adult society and the fact that we adults are not interacting and providing ways for our kids to understand what they can be and do. We've got to provide hope. It's also a terrible indictment of the neighborhoods they come from. Well, the neighborhoods are the lack of neighborliness, the right. lack of safety in their neighborhoods. What are we saying? to our kids about what we care about them when we can't even protect them you against bet. guns. And so it's about caring. It's about self-esteem. It's about a sense of future. If you don't think you're going to be any better off at 21 than you are at 14, why delay? Um, you know, so that we've really got to build in hope. The last thing I think it's important to say is that we can't tell our children not to have sex out of wedlock or not to have babies out of wedlock when the majority of births every year in this country, and both whites and black, um, are to adult women not to teens, okay? You can't tell 14-year-olds that it's bad to have a baby and then sort of, you know, glamorize our movie stars and others who have babies out of wedlock. You can't sort of have So what would you do about that? I mean, are you suggesting that Hollywood ought to show more responsibility in terms of the kinds of movies they make? And, and yes. then, therefore, as soon as you say that, they'll say, you know, we don't need any, any censorship from you, Ms. Edelman. Well, I'm for the First Amendment. 
But I'm also telling Hollywood and television and rock music that they teach, that they send out signals. And I'm also telling parents that we've got to sort of say, you certainly have a right to broadcast that, but I have a right to turn it off right. and I have a right to protest. But you cannot have this culture tell young people that sex is bliss without consequence, that violence is the way we resolve yeah. disputes, and then act them, ask them to act differently. Yeah. So we need to shape up and decide what we are, what kind of values we yeah. want to transmit. And here, but here, it, uh, just to take one person, mm -hmm. I have followed and watched uh, the Reverend and Jesse Jackson preached this in high school throughout America in which he says because you can make a baby doesn't mean you can you're a man it doesn't take a man to make a baby right. and you wonder why that message doesn't resonate because it's got to be combined with with, with concrete things that give hope. Yeah. You can't just preach it, kids. Yeah. You gotta sort of have some real recreation there for them. You gotta give them some summer jobs. You Something gotta have, they can invest it's in. It's not a one-shot thing. Right. You gotta empower them to feel. You know, I, things were not wonderful when I was growing up in my little small rural segregated town. In Bennettsville, town. South Carolina. In Bennettsville, South Carolina, my great town. But what was important was that I had preachers and teachers and my parents who struggled with me, who always were there with me, telling me what was important, telling me that what was going on in the world was not about me, it was about them. Struggling with me to change that, when I went off to college, I had Dr. King and Benjamin Mays and Mordecai Johnson, these black role models, who were there struggling and always telling me we could change the world and we'll work with you as adults to change the world. Where are the adults now giving a moral vision, a sense that we can control our future, that we can change what's wrong in America and who are out there struggling with us? We don't get it out of the White House. We're not getting it out of the state houses enough. We're not getting it out of the private sector. We're getting messages that I should be for myself. What we have to really come to grips with is that children don't do what we tell them to do. They do what we do. And we need to get our act shaped up and stop sending messages that life is about having, it's about materialism, and that it's not not about community and it's about not about sharing. Marion Wright Edelman, back in a moment. Her book is The Measure of Our Success, a letter to my children <coughs> and to yours, and we'll talk more about an extraordinary life that she has lived, growing up in Bennettsville, South Carolina, making her way to Yale Law School, going back to Mississippi, the Civil Rights Movement, becoming the first woman, black woman, admitted to the Mississippi Bar. She went on to uh, make a commitment to after the civil rights movement to children. Some of the, her feelings have been reflected in the conversation so far. When we come back, the personal side of Marion Wright Edelman, back in a moment. I know, I know, oh, I know, I know, absolutely. No, no, I know, but that is, it is. But why can't you see that's the problem? I mean, I, not, not about Jesse, but you, but you got to say that publicly, well, don't say, you? Well, I do say that. I, I do. Yeah, I know. You just don't. You, you don't want. You know. <coughs> Shiloh Baptist. You know what? We are back with Marion Wright Edelman, uh, Shiloh Baptist Church. Your father was. All right. Yeah. You know, I mean, one of the things I love to do when I go back to Washington is go to the Shiloh Baptist Church. That's in my church in Washington. Uh, and it's wonderful. It's I, a I, great church. I go, as, i got to promise you, though, I go as much for the music as I, t <laughs> as I do for the sermon. But let me tell you about the Shiloh Baptist Church because in, it, in, in Bennettsville or in Washington? Well, I can tell you about both of them, but okay, in Washington, D.C., right. because I'm very happy to be in that church. It, it also has the Shiloh Baptist Church Family Life Center. Yeah, it it's does. in the middle of the shore area. We built that center so that young people would have a place to come, where right. single parents would have a place to come, where mentoring and role modeling programs could have a place to come, you know, could be there to begin to provide actual day-to-day -day sustained supports for families and for kids where the church could come together and play racquetball yeah. and basketball. We need to have family life ministries and family life centers in every congregation and synagogue in America so that there is an alternative, positive place for young people to the streets where they see important moral institutions who value them enough. Right. You know, we need to have tutoring and mentoring centers in all of our religious congregations. If the families have broken down as they have in so par many parts of America, we have got to reweave and extend it family centers because it takes a whole community to raise a child and to make children feel cared for. Now, you, Peter is Jewish. Peter's Jewish. Now, how'd you raise the kids? Are they 
you got three kids. We raised them to understand they have two traditions, a right. Jewish religious tradition and a Baptist religious. They went to church with me right. until they reached their senior year in college. They also had Jewish training. And then they had training. a chance to make a choice between or Well, or I don't know what choices they will make. Um, yes, they obviously will make their own choices. Yeah. But they went through and they were bar mitzvahed. We had bar, bar, you know, bar mitzvahs in our backyard. Bar mitzvahed and baptized. And well, <laughs> you know, when they were beginning, we had always from the time that they were born, we had a, we had a person of a Jewish religious tradition and a Christian tradition come when those children were born right. until they got both. And we'd like to say that they're doubly blessed. Yeah. Um, and then they went through Jewish training and were bar mitzvahed in our backyard with both sides. My Baptist preacher brother opened those Jewish bar mitzvahed because we wanted them to know that what, you know, what brings us together is much greater than what divides us. And they still do go to church from occasionally. I don't know what they're going to do, but I do hope that they understand from both parents who come out of different religious traditions that we believe in something beyond ourselves, that there is a God out there yeah. or there is a calling you, out you there. You pray every day. Oh, yeah, I pray all yeah. the time. All the time. I mean, you can be in a car and you, you say a little prayer. Well, the thing I do, I, I try to pray the way, the way I live. Okay, I mean, I try to pray, and what I do, I try to remember why I do what I do. But I, I you know, I, most of what I do is, I hope, out of the recognition that there is a presence here yeah. with me and that I'm here trying to fulfill that calling. You, you participated in the Civil Rights Movement mm -hmm. um, during the 60s, in fact. Um, and then after that, after the Civil Rights Movement, and let's assume the success of the Civil Rights Movement, you know, how do you measure uh, what happened to you uh, so that most people who were participants in the Civil Rights Movement, who made that contribution, who felt like they had achieved certain goals and felt good about their contribution, uh, especially during the 60s and, and the legislation was passed, they went on to another life, doing other things, law professors, a lot of other things. You seem to have dedicated yourself to a new mission. What was it about you that made you do that? I think, again, it gets back to the values with which I was raised, that when you see a need, you try to respond. Why children? Why children? Because in 1964 in Mississippi, after we had the successful summer project where we were trying to register people to vote, the whole country's eyes were poised on Mississippi. Everybody went home in September. Right. And I was left with hundreds of thousands of cases, and the people who went out to register to vote were left without jobs, were left without food, were left without housing because they were kicked off plantations. And I began to understand already that unless you put the social and economic underpinnings under people, that political and civil rights would be hollow. Yeah. And thank heavens the next year Head Start came um, as a part of the poverty program, and the state of Mississippi refused to take it. And so civil rights and religious groups were able to get a program that served 13,000 poor children and gave 3,000 poor parents training and comprehensive health services and they began to get a new vision of a future and I watched what that program meant for children and began to see them have a new sense of possibility and I remember talking to the superintendent of one of the formerly segregated school systems talking about how these Head Start kids came in their school asking all these questions and making all these demands mm -hmm. and it was terrific but poor parents were empowered to sort of work together to make sure that their kids had a better life than they had but Senator Stennis mm -hmm. who was the chairman John. of the Appropriations Committee attacked that program, held up all the poverty money until they would, the till Sergeant Schreiber would unfund that. And, you know, we had to fight back because poor parents were doing what they said they were going to do. And so it was really out of the understanding that you have to give people the means to exercise rights. You have to give them housing and food and jobs so that they can do what they want to do for their kids. That's key, and that is why I moved to Washington to see if I couldn't protect programs like Head Start to fight the Senator Stennis's who were trying to undermine mm -hmm. what parents were trying to do, and that kind of led to, to, to uh, my mission. And in 1973, you established Children's Defense Fund. Right. And soon you'll celebrate next year, you'll celebrate the 20th. Yeah. Anniversary 20. of that. You what? Going to be 20 years old. We're uh, trying to grow up. And what was the mission of the Children's Defense Fund? It is to provide to a, voice a voice for all children, to encourage our country to invest in children preventively before they get sick, before they drop out of school, before they get pregnant, before their families break up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we're trying to do that, you know, for all kids because, again, I want to just emphasize that there are more white poor kids in this country than, than black poor kids. That there are more poor kids in working families. That, mm -hmm. you know, but, this but is a universal but the problem. It sure is, but the percentage in terms of the population is, oh, is significantly more groups. among minority groups. Absolutely, they're disproportionately poor, and so we always ask two questions. How can we help all kids, and then how do we help those kids who have special needs at the bottom, those kids who are disabled, those kids who are black or brown or Latino, um, those kids who um, are homeless, but you know, 
we've got to begin to understand that, you know, saving each of our children really depends on trying to invest in everybody else's kids. Mm -hmm. Because my kids got to walk down the street with those poor kids. All right, let me talk about this. So this is, I, I, I want to, I've never heard your side of this. It is the article I read in U.S. News and World Report called Unraveling of the Kids' Crusade. Marion Wright Edelman moved a nation to help its children, but her battle was bitter, and its moment of triumph, her, moment, her movement has splintered. You know what I'm talking about. It was the conflict, the letter you wrote with to um, uh, Congressman uh, George Miller, Miller and, Downey. and Downey. Do you regret writing that letter in which you castigated them uh, and said that if legislation fails, then they would have the burden? Of course not. Listen, I mean, there's a double standard here in this country about sort of people who advocate for kids and for the poor and women. Right. Um, the, the movement didn't splinter. Right, that's we disagreed with people on policies. People in Washington disagree on policies all the time. What's the big deal? Because I disagreed with two congressmen um, who are, you know, on a child care bill. Yeah. We ended up getting both, okay? Yeah. Um, the but, movement I mean, didn't come, splinter. Ha, and come back together with Congressman Absolutely. Miller and Congressman Downey? And so. well, I don't know, but, but you know, Mr. Downey and I are working together today to try yeah. to pass family preservation legislation. And I hope everybody who is listening to this because in Washington you fight and you go back and you, you do business on the next issue. That's what Washington is about. If I didn't speak to the people I disagreed with in Washington, I wouldn't have a friend in the world. But business is business yeah. and personal relationships and, are personal okay, relationships. Okay, and what's the operative idea that you come to the table with is that however strident I have to be and however strong I have to be that I speak for the voiceless and therefore, you know, I hear wasn't me. strident. Hear, okay. You okay. don't ever hear them describe men who are insistent on getting their corporate loophole, loophole passed yeah. as being strident. Even and though they're tougher and more demanding. I am as tough for children as any lobbyist is. I am as persistent for children as any lobbyist is. I don't buy double standards, all right? Yeah. I don't. And when you look at the language that the press and the others use to describe me, you know, they wouldn't ever do that with men. They wouldn't ever do that with people representing constituents. constituency. We went up and took children right. to lobby on the Hill to get this child care bill moved, which we tried for four years. You know, somebody called us bullies. Bullies because the children but came up care, to say... But you don't care, do you? If the day I began to care about what people say about me as opposed to what they do for children, I should go out of business. Yeah. But the point is, I want to just point out the double standards. Secondly, people do disagree. Thirdly, I hope the message is there that, um, you know, you're not free to walk all over, you know, women and, and, and people right. who advocate for the poor. And four, we're back to doing business. And okay. I hope with a little but, bit more respect. But I, it should be said, okay, it should be said that, that in fact, these comments did came from men, but it, it came from, from Congressman Miller, a liberal, a man who the Children's Defense Fund uh, had honored as its man of the year, of or person course. of the year, right? Right. But who, who, who says liberals said, always have to disagree every day on everything? I mean, we, you know, you got to feel free to take on your friends as well as your enemies for kids. Uh, and how goes the movement for children today? I mean, here we are into a new presidential campaign. I don't hear from Perot or Bush or Clinton a high priority for children. Maybe if I listen more carefully, I would hear it. Are you satisfied that children's issues have a prominent enough place on the political debate in America in this campaign season? Of course not, but we're determined to make it so because children are a Healy issue. We've got to begin oh, to what put kind of issue? a Healy oh, issue. Oh, Healy, okay. They are the issue that is going to make or break this, children, this country's future more than any other. I think that Los Angeles' explosion is about lack of hope and okay, lack of rape. Okay, speak to me about what Los Angeles' explosion is. Before I do that, but I really want to come back because this year we have launched a Leave No Child Behind campaign to educate the American public through TV ads, which is just beginning right. to go on, radio ads, posters and everything else. Boy, that we have a national child emergency and you better do something about it and two we have to get voters and parents and all caring people about the future of this country to really insist that our political leaders on all sides of the aisle stop they're making wonderful speeches about kids yeah. Mr. Bush talks about family values. Have all of them talk about, about the children. Education president. Oh, absolutely. But and the then issue Clinton is talks about he's the education governor. Absolutely, but the key issue is what are they committing themselves to do? And so we have done a packet of action for every citizen to say, are you going to commit to a healthy start, a head start, and a fair start? And we need to begin to build a fire under all of them so that they begin to put their mouth behind their, you know, their money behind their mouth. <laughs> and secondly, you know. Take Head Start. You know, the president's for it. You yeah. know, everybody's for it. Yet, you know, it still reaches only a third of the eligible kids. 
There's Why? a new bill Why? because, because, because when they go, we have an unjust budget agreement that still gives the military and the wealthy priority on the budget process. We're all for it, but our hands are tied. Well, they made that budget agreement. The president agreed with that. They can unmake it so that we can begin to deal with the war that is destroying our children here at home, get some summer Head Start money out there, get some summer youth job money out there. They don't say right. that when the SNLs involved. Speak to Los Angeles. Um, and, and how you saw that and what you think Los Angeles ought to say to the nation and whether it ought to be, as, as many of us uh, have quoted, a fire bell in the night, you know, an alarm bell, a wake-up call for well, this country. Well, it is an explosive wake-up call, but it just said what a lot of folk who, who, who have been having their eyes open and their ears open know that there is a war going on here at home. Between? Between among. the rich and the poor, between black and white, between ages, because we have had a, set of, a series of messages in this country that said, you know, it's okay to be just for me, it's okay to scapegoat peaceable on the base of race, it's okay to sort of decry differences or to sort of, you know, to have racial innuendo. We have been going through an era of divisive politics that have said it's okay to be just for me. We have seen the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We have seen national security be defined only in terms of arms yeah. and dealing with enemies of war. But there are a lot more poor in America than there are rich. There are lots more poor yeah. in and America so than there are, but they are this, not and getting this is their a, fair and this share is a democracy too. This is a democracy. So why isn't the system changing? Well, the system is going to have to change if we're going to remain the kind of country we are. You cannot contain the kind of rage that came out. You cannot have a criminal justice system that does not work fairly, that singles out black males, you know, without any sense of what they have done and who they are. You have got to begin to pay attention to the fact that we are not providing fair opportunity for all of our citizens. Um, and, and Los Angeles is about the fact that our racial divisions have have become huge chasms, yeah. that there are tens of thousands of folk without hope, and we've got to confront that. But it also was about a fury against uh, uh, South Korean Americans, about Asian Americans, too, that some say was unjustified and, well, and you know, unfair. It's, you know, it's very complicated. You know, I mean, I think that in some ways, when that, 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 that black girl was shot by yeah. the Asian American yeah. store owner, and they felt that the criminal justice system did not meet out a fair of justice, and right. a lot of that, yes. a lot of it is also about our lack of understanding of each other and the different cultures that have come to make up the mosaic of America. And we really do need to begin to understand about our diversity and understand and learn how to communicate. But most importantly, it is about the lack of hope. It's about the lack of economic opportunity. You know, we lose more young black and Latino men in Los Angeles to violent deaths every month than were killed in that explosion last week, but nobody says a word. We lose more black children. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., not California. You know, there are more black men dying on the streets of America and, every year to gun, but and, nobody's saying anything. Yeah. I mean, wh why Well, all of a I'm not sure, Mary, they're not, people aren't saying something. I mean, I see a lot of stories about that. I, it's not a question of people not saying something about it. They're not doing anything they're about it. I mean, it. I see story after story. I mean, I've talked about on this broadcast and other broadcasts about a whole generation of African-American men, you know, and 25% and of them, you know, over between the ages of, what, uh, 20 and 30 are somehow tied up in the, in the judicial well, system. where have we seen these Well, who is acting and where is the, where is the people hold, holding feet to the fire of politicians to change? Well, I agree that it is about a lack of action, but one, it is also about the lack of a moral climate. I haven't heard the President of the United States or all of our key governors stand up and decry the loss of death that takes a child's life every three hours because of gunshot wounds. I haven't heard them call up and say we've got to stop having the proliferation of guns that is killing our children in their schools and, the, and you know they can't walk to school safely in their homes. Where have we had a moral statement about the growing violence in our society from our political leaders? Who have said, you know, how many young black and Latino and Asian American people are dying every day because of guns? And who is calling for gun control? Who is standing up in our national life to the National Rifle Association? But secondly... Well, they're losing their battles now. Well, that we haven't gotten because, it yet. Okay, but we they're beginning to lose those yet. battles. Well, they've got to lose them. We have got to stop the guns. We've got to stop kids being able to walk off on every corner and find a gun. But secondly, who has been speaking? 
for jobs and for housing and for community reinvestment strategies and for Head Start and for health care for our families. Who has been saying none of the Cold the Wars at home? Well, uh, yeah, but we, the Children's Defense Fund. The President of the United States has to do it. The right, governors have right. to do it. And we have to begin to make our children believe that we care by giving them alternatives to the street, by giving yeah. their families the means to support them, by giving young men the home hope yeah. of forming families. Yeah, I, You know what you haven't said yet, which I know is part of your own uh, deep vent sense of, of, of grievances in America is that when the savings and loan scandal came along, there was money. There is and money. There, there was an immediately a commitment to do something about the savings and loan fiasco when you travel across the country begging for more money for the America's children. Uh, there's always a question of where do we get the money? Our problem, there's no question about where we get the money. You know, the President of the United States says we have more will than wallet. That is just absolutely not right. You know, you're right. We found hundreds of billions of dollars for the savings and loans. We found as much as we needed to get to the Persian Gulf. We wanted to sort of save, you know, what was changed Saddam Hussein. We find well, millions of dollars. Did you support that war or not? Oh, I, listen, um, no. You did? No. No, um, and I, you know, because I, you know, I, you know, it, 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 you know, where are we now there? Um, what have we achieved? Well, what then, is the would democracy you have supported the war if, in fact, we'd gotten rid of Saddam, Saddam Hussein? Would that have made a difference? And therefore, no. it would have, if we'd reached the, the accomplished war goal. The that I preach on, Charlie, is about the war at home. I wish we had the same sense of urgency in mobilizing, you know, our, 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 our American public and our American resources to go in and save the war zones, you know, to, to stop the war that's going on in all of our inner cities to deal with the problems in our, 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 our areas. The money is here. It's about values. You know, while child poverty was growing by 26% in the 80s, you know, our gross national product was also growing. We can find the money to pay for what we want to do, and we've got to make them want to do it for our kids. Okay, let me come back and sort of pull back from the nature of this conversation, too. Tell me, are, are you, uh, what's the most satisfying moment that you have had in a full life committed to uh, others? What's brought you the most satisfaction where you feel that you have made a difference. Oh, I guess in, they've in an individual way or a broader sense. Oh, there are many. I mean, obviously, I'm deeply proud of my own children, and that's yeah. what that, that that's terribly important. But secondly, you know, we, you know, I, I look back, and, and 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 things have changed. You know, we people can make a difference. There's 750,000 disabled children going to school every year in this country because there's an Education Rural Handicap Children Act that didn't exist. There are hundreds of thousands of children who are getting a head start today, and who are going on to college and are forming healthy families. And we've, you know, moved head start from four to, you know, two billion dollars. There are millions of kids who are getting health care. But 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 you know, people. People are, are doing better because some things did make a difference. And so this whole notion that, that nothing has happened and nothing okay. has changed. You went back to Mississippi 1990, I yep. think, was it? And tell me what it was like to go back then because you had been there in 63 and right. you'd seen fear. Uh, you'd seen poverty. Senator Kennedy came there and that's how you, you know, met him and get, took him on a tour. I think it was 63, that's was right. it? And, and through that you met Peter Edelman who was his aide and then you later um, he became your husband and the father of these fine children. Uh, when you went back in 1990 to Mississippi, uh, and to those who say there's no progress, what do you say? I say there's a great deal of progress, but you know we still have a lot more to do. I went back, my old law yeah. student, when I moved to Mississippi, right. there were three black lawyers. I went back and you know one of my first law students in Mississippi, there are hundreds of lawyers, black lawyers in Mississippi now, one is sitting on the Supreme Court of, 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 of Old Miss. You know, I used to hear nigger on, on the local TV station, you know, that is now being run by an integrated board and by black folk. You know, I went up to Unita Blackwell to visit her. Yeah. Um, she's the mayor she's the of mayor. Bears Village, Mississippi. She and when you be, met her in 60, what was she She was, was doing? a sharecropper. She showed my son, you know, where she used to pick cotton for three dollars a day across there. And she's now in the mayor in charge of the What would she say white. about progress today? She would say we've come a long way in terms of political leadership, but she's also decrying the fact that economically we're going backwards. You know, we all saw the progress we did it made in eliminating hunger, but now people don't have jobs. People will begin to lose hope again, and we are beginning to see a regression in the political leadership in Mississippi. And so she understands very starkly that political power without economic power. Is not going to be enough to change things. And so even as she is the mayor, and that's an enormous amount of progress, and we have many black mayors in Mississippi and many black elected officials, and that's just terrific. On the other hand, unless there is an economic investment in our educational system and in jobs for young people, it's not going to be enough. And so she says things are real different, but boy, are things also bad as people can't find work. Two things that Marion Wright Edelman says in this that I deeply believe in, of which she says many things. One is never give up. And 
know that you can make a difference. Clearly, that has been a measure of, of, of what you have said, uh, not only to, to your children, but to across the country. When, when you look at, when you look at what your own personal agenda is now, uh, and we've talked about these moral values, and we've talked about, you know, the importance of family, uh, and we've talked about politicians not speaking out. Share with me a little bit more of your own personal agenda for the Children's Defense Fund. Well, we're going we're gonna to win. <laughs> we're going to get every American to be aware that we have a national child and family emergency and, and that we have got to begin to sort of be there for our kids. We are going to get kids on the agenda this year and get commitments to a healthy start, a head start, and a fair start. I see people all over this country, Charlie, who are beginning to be deeply concerned, who know something fundamental has come loose, who understand that and we've got to... What is fundamental come loose? It is our sense of self and our values. sense of values. It, you know, our families are breaking down. Drug and alcohol abuse are everywhere problems. Mm. You know, we are seeing a child abused or neglected every 30, 13 seconds. We have seen this loss of community. We see these growing racial and class divisions. We see the violence all around us. We are lost and there are people who understand that we have got to regain our moral bearings, that we have got to begin to reinvest in our people. We have got to reconnect with our kids. We've got to begin to work together. We can't keep putting people in prison. There are a million people in Do prison in America. Do you have any optimism though that the political process, I mean there was a lot of talk about that, that in 19... 92, in 1992, that somehow Americans, the Mer uh, Muster and Ms. America yes. across this country as reflected A, in the Brown campaign, B, you talked about the connection between money and special interest and the legislative process, and B, the Perot campaign because he somehow represents a frustration on the part that this could be a defining year uh, in terms of, of I'm not going to take it anymore, I but I'm going to look for other be. answers. I think this can still be a defining year because I think the American people do want change. They've been floundering around. They've been looking for a way to be galvanized. They're looking it. for the beacon. Yeah. But I think that this can be a defining year where we sort of say, listen, we have got to go in a different direction. One of the things that we're trying to do is to ask congregations Jewish synagogues and Muslim um, and, and religious congregations on October 17th and 18th to, to do a nation, thousands of them, to come together to do a moral witness for children and families, to examine ourselves about what we're doing with our kids, what we're doing on race, to really hold up the needs of children and, and families for ourselves and ask what we can do as one person of faith, what we can do as one congregation and ask what we can do to bring a more just society into being and see what that translates to and what we should be doing in the political process before that general election. We have got to ask ourselves as Americans, yeah. who do we want to go and get out there and do it? But there's going to be people all over America in every neighborhood and every religious congregation to say, here's the way we want to go, yeah. political leaders. And, and you, it's something you've said to me that struck me is that when you are feeling fatigued and when you're feeling low and when you're feeling like this, I'm pushing this rock up this hill, all you need to do is go to a hospital. Tell me about that. Well, you just have to remember, you know, we, we, we have there so much... There are those who have no voice. There, there are people who have no voice. There are people, when I think of when I start think about myself and things I can't make, go look at a one-pound baby struggling for life. With a, with and, an and a, a little intervener a everywhere who was addicted to drugs and, and sort of, you know, go out to a homeless who had, shelter. Who Nothing. did not choose to be a crack who baby. Did who did not choose, choose to be a to crack baby. Who did not choose to be a one- or two-pound baby. Who did not choose his parents or her parents. Right. You know, when you look at the outcome of that children, you look at that mother who didn't get prenatal care who doesn't have a car, who may not speak English, you go into a homeless shelter and you say, what would I do, Lord? If I had to get up every morning with my three kids, drag them out, and don't know if I can come back here again, don't know where my next meal is going to come from, then I sort of say, get up. I mean, you know, my faith sells me you don't have to win, but you have to keep struggling and keep trying, and that in those darkest moments is when there is new opportunity. So we just need to get out there and struggle and have faith in ourselves, have faith in this country, not give up, push those political leaders. They are political leaders. It does matter whether we vote. It does matter whether we write that letter to the editor. It does matter whether we call up that producer and say we like that show or didn't and like that show. And it does matter if, in fact, for people who do a disservice by just come and make speeches and then leave the hard work to those who are in the neighborhoods without paying any sense of commitment over the long term to them. Those Absolutely. Those people who are on the firing line who are having to deal with those issues Absolutely. every day of their Every life. Every single American, black, white, Latino, can make a difference to a child. We can find time to mentor. 
We can find time to tutor. We can give a little money to sort of give them, you know, a chance to go off to a camp. We can give them a summer job. We can write a letter on their behalf. You know, but we, we can each make a difference. We can teach our children to be fair and decent. We can teach them to be tolerant by not laughing at racial jokes or gender jokes, by trying to be the kind of moral examples. We can be honest, but we can show our children that this is a country that is a can-do country that can bring itself together again. Our best gotta, days are ahead of us. Our best days got to be ahead of us. Marion Wright Edelman, The Measure of Our Success, a letter to my children and to yours. Uh, children who don't have a voice are lucky to have her. Uh, as one who is trying to give some sense of, of the crisis that faces America's children because, in fact, they are our best hope for the future. I thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Week. Thank you for joining us.